2,000 years ago, Aristotle believed that some people were born naturally fit to be slaves. He lived in a culture where nearly every household owned one. He accepted the status quo. Today, we don't, and yet an estimated 27 million slaves remain in the world, more than ever in history, and 80% of them experience sexual abuse and exploitation. In Atlanta alone, the sex trafficking industry generates $290 million a year, and the FBI estimates at least 300 children are trafficked there every month. Sex trafficking is the fastest-growing illicit industry in the world. But I'm not actually here to talk about the horrors of sex trafficking. I'm here to talk about consistency. In our country, sex is legislated. We have outlawed rape, statutory rape, and pedophilia. When sex produces a child, we call it parenting, and we are legally bound to it for 18 years. When sex causes incurable diseases, we are legally bound to tell our partners about it forever. Sex is a legally significant act because of its physical, psychological, and relational consequences. And so far, the laws are consistent, right? It should occur between consenting adults who understand the risks and responsibilities that come with it. What about sex plus money? Forced sex for money we call commercial sex trafficking, and it's illegal. Consensual sex for money is prostitution, and it's still illegal here in all but two counties in Nevada. So basically, if money is exchanged for sex, a crime is committed. Unless someone films the sex and distributes it on the World Wide Web. <laughs> this we call hardcore pornography. And not only is it legal and protected as an expression of free speech, but we celebrate and encourage it as a rite of passage, recreational escape, and marital inspiration. But people are still getting paid to have sex, a legally significant act with physical, psychological, and relational consequences. This is the commodification of human beings for the pleasure of paying consumers for an estimated $14 billion a year. Remember the one with the free porn, the Friends episode from way back in 1998? From, from prime time to late night, our popular culture lightheartedly accepts the reality of porn consumption while simultaneously joining in the public outcry against sex trafficking. But remember how the tobacco companies denied any relationship with cancer for decades? Just like tobacco undeniably causes cancer, the pornography industry both drives and supplies the growing demand for sex slaves. Inconsistencies like this historically lead to injustice and hypocrisy, and ultimately weaken societies. Today, 96% of males surveyed and over 50% of females have viewed online pornography, mostly over their smartphones and often at work. Researchers can't find enough people who haven't seen porn to make a control group to study its effects. By age 12, nearly all of our nation's adolescents are allowing internet porn to set their sexual expectations. What does this mean? Instead of placing sex within the context of a dynamic, multi-layered, ever-changing relationship with a real person, the vast majority of pornography portrays sex as a solely physical act for predominantly male arousal, which proves insatiable. The addictive properties of live-action porn consumption parallel that of cocaine, especially on developing minds. Users require more extreme and deviant forms of pornography to get the same level of satisfaction, leading them to risk their education, jobs, and relationships while compulsively searching for novel scenes, added violence, and younger performers. In 2015, the most common search term for porn was teen. And younger and younger victims follow with over 116,000 searches for child pornography every day. 80% of men arrested for child sex abuse possess child pornography, more than half featuring children under the age of five. The demand for more extreme forms of violence also continues to increase. 
Two studies conducted in 2005 and 2010 reveal that 90% of the most popular porn downloads contain multiple instances of physical and verbal aggression and violence, all directed at women, who in turn give the appearance of enjoying it. And while 41% of the 304 scenes in one of the studies contained anal to mouth action, only 5% included vaginal sex. Still worse, of the results of a 2010 Google search for the term rape porn, 86% boasted the actual rape of girls under 18. 75% involved weapons, 43% included the realistic portrayals of drugged women, and 46% claimed incest. But if you're an amateur, a simple search for free porn today might take you here. Teen slave punishment, monster cock, and tiny Asian teens. Ass to mouth orgy. Ghetto asshole fucked by white cock. The list is quite literally endless. This is just a small and mild sample of what pops up on the world's largest porn sites. Fightthenewdrug.org says the vast majority of pornography viewed by millions of people every day is teaching that humiliation and violence are a normal part of what sex is supposed to be. And studies show that the more socially normal one believes a behavior, the more likely they are to act upon it. We are raising a generation of boys and girls compelled to act out this false norm of sexual dominance and perversion, not to mention the unavoidable sexist racism. Pornography arouses viewers to mentally and physically engage with behaviors they would never dream of acting upon in real life. But after multiple exposures, what was once shocking becomes mundane and the demand grows. Studies repeatedly show that people who view porn regularly are much more likely to pursue bought sex in real life. And as with any commodity, the lower the cost, the higher the profit, leading to inevitable exploitation of the most vulnerable. In fact, 80% of sex traffic survivors recall clients playing pornographic scenes for them to imitate. Pornography increases the demand for bought sex which lays the groundwork for modern-day slavery. The pornography industry also contributes to the supply of sex trafficking. Sex traffic survivors report hours of forced pornography viewing as systematic desensitization, or so-called training by their oppressors. Nearly half of survivors remember being forced or tricked into making pornographic film to shame them into submission. Today, it's estimated that at least 20% of current online porn footage depicts trafficked girls. And, depict, and, and detecting it is nearly impossible. Consider the fact that the largest porn entry site in the world, which entertained 78 billion views in 2014, acts primarily as a hub, directing viewers to live action camming sites and illegal tube sites, the most frequently viewed kind by men and women. Sites like these provide multiple platforms for traffickers to cash in on beautiful young lives without ever getting caught. Pornography drives and supplies the demand for sex trafficking. Finally, a growing amount of research considers the pornography industry itself a form of sex trafficking, calling it bought sex on camera. Interviews with porn performers look identical to those of trafficked survivors. They endure the actual enactment of sexual assault, so they are torn, gagged, bound, bruised, beaten, and verbally degraded while being penetrated and double penetrated in every way possible often by multiple people in a single scene. This might explain the well-documented prevalence of drug abuse and addiction in the industry. Furthermore, the STD rate among porn performers is 10 times greater than that of the same demographic in the general population. Actors have unprotected and often anal and oral sex with so many partners in their short four to six month careers on average that it's impossible to keep up with the rate of infection. In addition, adult film actors suffer from drug overdose, depression, alcoholism, suicide, accidents, and homicide, giving them the highest death rate of any legal industry. Out of 1,500 performers followed from 2003 to 2014, 228 had died, not from natural causes. President Obama decries the growing human trafficking dilemma, and Lady Gaga musically protests sexual violence. But while we universally object to a porn-inspired rape culture, we accept and embrace the production and consumption of porn itself. 42 million people regularly engage with violent sex online. 
This absolutely contributes to the practice of selling people. As you can see here, the cycle of pornography, objectification, and bought sex includes sex trafficking. Participation at any point in this cycle contributes to it. Viewing pornography forces me to see people as objects. And just by watching, my clicks alone fuel the demand for more workers, more variety. But many people don't stop there. Physically masturbating along with porn associates what I see on the screen with sexual arousal. My imaginative mind engages with the activity, making me feel like I'm the one participating. This makes it more likely that I will pursue bought sex. Maybe at a massage parlor where women and children are kept hidden by pimps and traffickers. The ability to tell who is there by choice and who is not evades me. And at this point, it might not matter because the porn I watch makes me believe that everyone loves what they're doing. My need for orgasm trumps reason. And the cycle continues, driving the demand. Alternatively, watching porn and seeing people as objects makes it more likely that I might develop an attraction to children, which increases the chance that I might abuse one. 95% of this nation's one and a half million runaways experienced abuse and pornography exposure in the home and one-sixth of them will succumb to the false promises of a prowling trafficker within 48 hours. And as I've stated, most of them will be forced to watch and perform sex online, supplying the demand. And the cycle begins again. Leo Tolstoy said that everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. We are either a part of the solution or a part of the problem. There's no neutral when it comes to valuing each individual as a person who craves to be known and loved. Every pornographic download exploits somebody's child, mother, sister, brother, friend. Fellow human beings inherently worthy of our respect. When we reduce a person to the sum of their body parts and eliminate the third dimension of their humanity, we uphold the same cultural mindset that drives sex slavery. By accepting the status quo, like Aristotle, and denying the causal relationship, like the tobacco companies, we also contribute to the slavery of 27 million people. If you still think your orgasm is worth the price being paid for it, which you're completely free to do, at least own it. Be aware. Don't be a hypocrite. Thank you.